It is a very sad truth that we can believe the right things, know the true God, and do nothing about it. As you look at your life, what does your life say about you? If you were put on trial today and accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, we talked yesterday a lot about culture and possibly the largest cultural shift that I've ever seen and possibly one of the most unusual global cultural shifts the world has ever seen. And Jonah, we heard, is struggling with the injustice of what he sees. And he has moral questions and he thinks God's moral reasoning is wrong. That God may be wrong in what he's saying and wrong in what he's doing. And he runs away. But there are other questions we have too. A couple of months ago, I, was, I read this in one of the world's largest uh, newspapers. The, the uh, journalist said, for the past half a century, we have tried to construct a world without identity and morality. Instead, we have left it to two systems to deal with the problem of our collective life, to the market economy and to the liberal democratic state. Morality has been outsourced to the market. The market gives us choices, and morality has been reduced into a set of choices in which right and wrong have no meaning beyond the satisfaction of my desire or the frustration of my desire. See what he's saying? When we think of morality, the only question we ask is, will this satisfy my desire or will it frustrate my desire? We find it increasingly hard to understand why there might be things that we want to do we can afford to do, and that, but we should not do. We do not recognize there are things we should not do because they are dishonorable or disloyal or demeaning. They make us less than we should be. In a word, there are things which are unethical. We all need a sense of identity, who am I, and morality, how I should live. And in any country or people, these two things inform how we understand who we are and how we should act. And as we come back to the book of Jonah, we see in Jonah that he is struggling with both of these. He's lost a sense of his true identity and also of true morality. He's forgotten both. In chapter 1, you will see the people ask Jonah a lot of questions. Jonah is now on the boat, and the storm comes. They wake him up. They ask him to pray. He doesn't pray. And then they come back to Jonah, and they say, who is responsible for this? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? They are asking a question of identity and morality. Who are you? And what is going on? God uses a group of non-believers to speak to Jonah to remind him of who he is. And after Jonah gives his initial answer, they ask more questions. What have you done? And what should we do in order to get out of this? It's an incredible sense of questions they ask Jonah. Jonah is a Hebrew. He is a member of the nation of Israel. Why did God choose Israel? Well, in Ezekiel chapter 16, we are told God chose Israel not because they were beautiful, 
not because they were famous, not because they were rich, not because they had anything, but because He loved them. It was His grace. He loved them. As a matter of fact, God says, when I found you, you were naked, you were dirty, you were in the gutter, and I saved you, and I washed you, and I clothed you, and I gave you beauty, and I gave you fame, and I made you successful. The history of the people with which Jonah is a part is a history of love and grace. God says, I loved you, I have blessed you, and yet now you turn away from me. God is speaking through these questions asked by non-Christians to remind Jonah of his true identity, his true belief, and what he should believe about God. But before they can ask these questions, they need to ask the first question, which is, why are you sleeping? Because you can't speak to someone who is asleep. So they wake him up first in order to speak to him. Imagine a big storm. How can Jonah sleep? Now, Jesus fell asleep in a boat. But Jesus slept in a boat because he had peace with God. And they wake him up and say, why are you sleeping? We're going to die. And Jesus goes, and he speaks one word, and the sea goes calm. But Jonah sleeps not because he has peace, but because he's most probably depressed. I don't know if any of you have wrestled with depression or know people who've suffered with depression. When you're depressed, you sleep a lot. And Jonah is running from God. He's angry. He is sad at what may happen. And he just falls into a deep, deep sleep. And they wake him up. One of the questions we have to ask ourselves is as we look at the world in which we live, are we actually asleep? Sometimes the church goes to sleep. We go to sleep especially when we lose hope, when we think that everything is hopeless, that God can do nothing. But that is not the message actually of this chapter or of this book. There is always hope. Now, what makes the hope easy to see is when you see how far Jonah ran away. Jonah went the Bible says in verse 3, down to Joppa. Then in the next verse, down into the boat. Then into the next verse, down into the bottom of the boat. So he's going further down. And he gets thrown headlong into the sea. He, Jonah says, throw me head first. If you jump into a swimming pool feet first, you go down, and you start to come up. You throw them head first, wearing clothes, you're just sucked all the way down. And in chapter 2, he says, I went to the bottom of the sea. And then he says, all the way to the land of the dead, to Sheol, to hell, literally, as far away from God as you can possibly go. Jonah's running away from God is total. He cannot go any further. And Jonah is learning, however, that there is a big difference between suffering for doing God's will and suffering for not doing God's will. The church is filled with all kinds of inspiring stories of what happens when you suffer for doing God's will. But Jonah is now suffering because he is not doing God's will. He is disobedient. Is it possible some of us in this room are in very deep suffering because of our disobedience right now? Does it feel like you're drowning? And if the feeling is overwhelming, we ask questions. Is there any hope? My guilt is so great. Will God hear me? There are times when it feels God's call on our life is challenging the very basis of who I am. It's so difficult to obey. 
It's like he's asking us to do something, and it feels impossible. And actually, it is impossible. But the good news is that God wants to change us. God wants to transform us. Sometimes you talk to business people, and they've run away with someone they work with in the office, and they will say things like, I couldn't help myself. That's just the way I am. God made me that way. Or I just fell in love. How could I deny it? I had to do this and, and betray everything. And the answer to this is no and yes. There's a part of this which is true. Yes, we cannot change ourselves. We cannot transform ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. That is true. Some people, when they listen to the gospel being preached, think the gospel is bad news. Why? Because the message seems to be something like this. You're a sinner, and you can't save yourself, and God will judge you. It's like you're in the sea, and you're drowning in a sea of sin, and you're trying to swim to get out. And no matter how hard you try, the further you sink, and then you drown. And then God comes and punishes you for drowning. Now, is that fair? Well, if that is the gospel, that is not fair. But imagine this. Imagine you're in the sea. You're drowning in it. You can't swim. Someone comes and offers you their hand and says, take my hand, I'll pull you out. And you say, oh no, if I get out, I'll do it on my own. And the guy in the boat says, you're crazy. You can't swim. Look at the waves, you're drowning. Take my hand, I will, I will pull you out. And you say, no, 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 not interested. And then you drown. Now, does this change the story? The message of the gospel is that in Christ, God reaches out His hand of salvation to all of us. He says, you can't get out of this mess. Take my hand. I'll pull you out. Have you put your hand in His? He is able to save. God is reaching out to Jonah all the way through this book. The book of Jonah is not really a book of prophecy. It is a book about a prophet. First, God speaks to Jonah with a voice. He doesn't listen. He runs away, so then God sends a storm. He still doesn't listen. Then God speaks to Jonah through the non-believing sailors. He still doesn't listen. Eventually, Jonah says, throw me into the sea, and he gets followed up by a giant fish, and now all of a sudden, he's interested in listening. But here's what's interesting. Notice in Jonah chapter 1, where is Jonah's prayer? The captain says, pray, but he doesn't pray. Jonah doesn't pray until chapter 2, until he's in the water. He is silent. Now, there are two reasons why we are silent as believers. Number one, we don't know what to say, and we can't say it. I have a privilege of having um, various older uh, members on our team who are incredibly inspiring to me. There is nothing more inspiring than meeting people who've walked with the Lord a long time and still love Him. It's very inspiring. One of those people who works with us now is called John Bechtel. His parents were missionaries to China. He was active in his church. He went to a good Christian university. He graduated top of his class. He was offered his first job as a school teacher. As he is traveling down to the school, he gets a letter promoting him to headmaster. There are only two other teachers, one of them had done something very bad. The other one couldn't lead. So they said, okay, now you're in charge. So he arrives, he's the headmaster. He's there for two days, and the judge of the town comes to him, the law judge. He says, John, 
come to my house, I want to meet, introduce you to the head of the hospital. He goes to the judge's house. The judge says, John, I want you to meet the head of the hospital, and I'm the judge, all three of us believers, we are now going to tell people about Jesus. John said, how do you do that? They said, follow us. They get in a car, they drive two miles, they park. They get out of the car. John says, what are you going to do? They said, we go to doors, we knock on the door, we tell people about Jesus. John's thinking, feeling nervous. They go to the first door. They knock it. A woman opens it. She is wearing a bathrobe. She has rollers in her hair, and she's holding a cup of coffee. John Bechtel is six foot six. The judge is six foot seven. The head of the hospital, six foot eight. If you need meters, you need to ask someone who was born later than me. That's tall. The judge looks at the woman and says, Madam, my name is Judge Smith. I am the judge of this town. This is John. He is the headmaster of the local school. And this is my other friend, Mark. He is the head of the hospital. We want to come and talk to you. She stands with her coffee and she goes, oh my God. The judge says, that is correct. We wish to speak to you about your God. They walk into the front room and the wife looks at her husband. He is wearing a vest, small vest, naked arms, shorts, holding a beer, watching TV. The wife says, darling, these men want to speak to us. This is the judge. This is the head of the hospital. This is the head of, headmaster of the school. The man looks at them, big eyes, and says, oh my God. <laughs> the judge says, that is correct. We wish to speak to you about your God. They sit down in this small house, and the judge turns to John Bechtel and says, John, Tell these good people about Jesus Christ. John spoke for 30 minutes and said nothing. At, at the end of 30 minutes, his face was red. He got up, he said, I can't do this, and he walked out of the house. The judge chased him out of the house, said, where are you going? John said, I'm done. I can't do this. And the judge says, well, what about all these other houses? And John says, you're on your own. And the judge says, it's a long way back to walk from where we came. He said, I'll walk. It was the longest walk of his life. Christian parents, Christian school, church, university. He couldn't speak the gospel. And for the first time, he realized he needed help if he was to ever tell anyone about Jesus. No one had taught him to do it. Can you? Sometimes we're silent because we don't know what to say. But the reason for Jonah's silence is different. He's too ashamed to speak. He knows the truth, he knows the message, he knows about repentance, he cannot say it, he cannot even pray. Eventually when they say, what should we do? So now the non-believers ask the believer for a prophetic word, tell us what to do, Jonah says, throw me into the sea and everything will be fine. It's because of me this is happening to you. And they throw him into the sea, and the sea is still, and the people on the boat believe. Well, wouldn't you? This is incredible. God is reaching out to Jonah. Now, here's the other interesting thing we learn about the boat. In the boat, 
the non-believers who believe in false gods and have false ideas about God are doing the right thing. They are praying. They are throwing the cargo into the sea to make the boat lighter so it will float. They're trying to row ashore. Wrong belief, right action. Jonah, however, believes in the true God, and he has true belief, but his actions are wrong. He's not praying. He's not seeking the Lord. He's not helping. He's doing nothing. It is a very sad truth that we can believe the right things, know the true God, and do nothing about it. As you look at your life, what does your life say about you? If you were put on trial today and accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Where is the evidence in your life right now? You see, in this story, it's full of surprises. We expect the non-believers not to want to repent, in my sense, not to turn to God and to die. And you expect the prophet to tell them, you must repent, you must turn to God, and He will forgive you. But what happens in this story? Jonah is happy with destruction, but the non-believers want deliverance. And they're even asking Jonah, what should we do? The non-believers are asking for it. I have another colleague. uh, His name is Dan. He was speaking at a university about a year and a half ago on sex. At the end of his preach, he said, I will give you two minutes to think of questions. And as he was coming back up, the captain of one of the big sporting teams came to him, grabbed him, and said, I can't stay. I need to leave now. But what should I do? And Dan, not sure what to say, as he was walking up the steps to speak again, was, "Uh, you need to bend your knee. So the guy went, okay, I'll go to my room and I'll do that. And then Dan thought, that makes no sense. Why did I say that? He said, leave your email with my friend before you leave. I need to write to you. The next morning, he gets a phone call. Can you have lunch with me and my sporting team? So they meet around the table. The captain of the team looks at all the other team, and he bangs the table. He says, guys, we're living wrong. He says, we're sleeping with everyone we want to sleep with. We're watching as much pornography as we want. Every time we see a girl, we give them a ranking from 1 to 10, and we're empty we're being destroyed by it, this man will tell us what to do. (laughs) Dan explained the gospel to them. And an hour later, one of them with tears in his eyes said, what should we do? And the captain said, you have to bend the knee. (laughs) And in the restaurant, they all got down on their knees and they became Christians. There are some people who are desperate for deliverance. They are looking for a way out. And we need to wake up at times to some of the opportunity which is before us. There are some people who hate us, and there are others who oppose, and there are others who are desperate for a word of hope. Will you be that person? How are we doing? We say we believe in prayer, right? Do you pray? We say that we believe God can change your life. Is your life changed? We say we have no fear of death because we will be raised on the last day. Are you living without fear? Almost a year ago, I was in a country I I won't name, The morning I was meant to preach, a big bomb went off in the city I was in. I had been speaking with a government minister the day before, and he, who was a non-believer, 
He sent his bomb-proof, bulletproof car to drive me to where I was going. He was worried for my safety. When we arrived at the church in the middle of nowhere, the army was outside protecting the church. They were worried the church would be bombed. But because the army were outside, and because I arrived in a government car, all the people in the town, all the non-believers of a different religion, came to the church wanting to know what is going on. So I have a message for believers. I'm two sentences into preaching, and someone runs up to me and says, you have to preach a different message. So I close my notebook, I open my Bible, and I say, I have some good news for you all. <laughs> I will never forget the tears as they ran down people's faces as they gave their lives to the Lord. Sometimes our unwillingness to go where it is dangerous may mean that we're missing out on some of what God has for us. It's one of the most incredible things. And one of the sad things of this story is Jonah is missing out on the blessings God has for him because he's not obeying God's call. Are you? But there's a huge hope in this story, and it's in chapter 2. Jonah ran away from God to go where God isn't, all the way to hell. And in the place where he thought God would be absent, he meets him. Now, Jonah actually prays two prayers. You can tell this from the grammar. In Jonah chapter 2, at the beginning, um, in verse 1, in the past tense, Jonah says, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. When Jonah is thrown into the sea, in distress, he finally calls out to God, save me. And he's swallowed by a whale or a big fish. Later in, the, in his prayer, it's in the present tense. He's now giving thanks and praise to God from within inside the big fish, from within inside the whale. Now, Interestingly, Jonah never really repents. First of all, he says, the cold water, that will wake you up. He says, God, save me, and he's saved. The fish comes and swallows him. And eventually, in the fish, he says, God, you're a good God. You are the true God. I will do what you will have me do. There are two different prayers. What does that mean for us? It means however unworthy you feel right now, however far from God you may be, however deep and low you may have gone, God can save you. It means no matter how terrible the culture is, no matter how much in rebellion it is against God, however far it has gone, there is hope. God can hear. He will hear, will we pray. Being faithful to God doesn't always mean we will be successful. Isaiah was much more faithful as a prophet than Jonah. Jonah saw huge evangelistic success. Isaiah was cut in half. Which would you rather be? Now, that's a hard question. When you pray, do you pray for success or for faithfulness? God asks us to be faithful first. Isaiah is the better prophet. God can turn around any situation no matter how hard. I have a friend who mentored me and looked after me for many, many years. It is true that he ran the most successful terrorist cell in North American history. In prison, he's allowed outside once a week for 20 minutes. The rest of the time, he can read. He reads all kind of hate-filled literature. Eventually, he asks if he could read a Bible. He gets as far as reading in the Gospel of Matthew. What does it help someone to gain the world and yet lose their soul. 
and for the first time, he realized he was a sinner. He was leading a life so in opposition to God, and God met him in a prison cell and changed his life. The transformation in his life was so deep and so obvious, the government in the end decided to release him so that he could speak about how wrong he had been, that the terrible things he would do, was doing needed to be stopped, and urging people to turn to Christ. God can reach you in the deepest of depth. The gospel can change and transform everything. And what we read in the book of Jonah is he will even use non-believers to do it if you won't. The non-believers are saved and the non-believers give thanks to God. Thank you for listening. May God bless you.